All right, everyone, welcome to Ask Us Anything. My buddy Juan and I have hopped on here to talk about all the things, right? I put out those 10 videos this week on Model Driven versus Canvas app, which is a story that Juan has wanted me to tell for a long time. So I finally told the story, but I said, hey, Juan, you got to join me to, uh, to do it. And so since the series has been so popular, so many questions, so much has happened with it, we thought it was easier for us just to go live and take your questions to talk through what you want to know about that. I'm guessing you guys will stray a little bit, but you know, we'll, we'll try to pretend like they're all related to the series. To that end, I guess maybe the first question we should start with, Juan, like is the one I wrote down, right? The whole purpose of the series was what is better, model-driven or Canvas apps? That really depends, right, on the use in case. Unfortunately, it's not a, a clear cut battle, right? That would be my, my answer, right? It, it really depends. What do you yeah. have, Shane? I know. I think it's totally the right answer, right? Like, and I tried to kind of talk about that a little in the series. They, they both have their pros and their cons. They both are super interesting. And it really just depends on what you're after. You know, if you're looking for that beautiful, customized experience, doing a bunch of stuff, you want to have a very specific look, a very specific feel, Canvas app, probably going to get you there better, right? On the other hand, right, man, I just want to collect some data, or maybe have some relationships, show it back, filter it, sort it do some of that core stuff and I, you know, not hung up on what it looks like. Oh, model driven apps can do that and do that really fast for you. So yeah, I, I don't think this is a either, or if you have the licensing uh, to do them, I think that you should have a healthy mixture of the two. Or how about combining the two of them, right? With custom pages. Yeah. You know, and that yeah. is something that I probably should have added to the series, but I did not. Um, and, and I kind of, I don't know, I felt let down like in myself that I didn't do that. But Juan's absolutely right. One of the things that you're going to continue to see is that people are going to build model-driven apps. And in model-driven apps, you can go in and add a what they call a custom page, which means you can then just bolt in a Canvas app. And boom, right now you kind of get the best of both worlds. It's a Canvas app just embedded right in your model-driven app, which I think is a very neat way to, to do that. Juan, do you have a good example of that you could show? Do you have one of those laying around? Uh I do have, I mean, uh, yep, we can, sh I can show something. All right. While you get that open, let me know. I'll, I won't share your desktop until you're ready. Uh, but yeah, and so, and Larry had asked earlier, right? Do you think that Microsoft will eventually merge the two? And yeah, absolutely, Larry, right? Like, I think at some point in the future, I don't know if that's next year or in 10 years from now, but at some point we won't have model versus Canvas. It'll just be one thing, um, right? So we call that convergence. Yeah, Microsoft is absolutely going to continue to build towards that story. And I think what Juan's about to show us where you can embed a Canvas app inside of a model-driven app, that's one of the first steps. Another first step is um, the controls, right? So we know that model-driven kind of has its own clunky controls today. Canvas has its own clunky controls. Dataverse for Teams had its own clunky controls. Like, and one of the things you're going to see, I think they're hoping for this year, like in the spring or the summer, is they are trying to get all of the controls onto what they call um, modern controls or fluent. I think it's fluent, fluent. controls. And so fluent then control. every, no matter where you're at, you'll have the same controls um, using the same code, the same behaviors, the same look and feel. Once again, just another step in that convergence policy. So I think you're going to continue to see more and more of that. There you go. There's Juan's desktop. So what do you got? All right, guys. So basically what we have in here is a model-driven form, right? And let's say you want to have a specific look or you want to navigate your users to a very specific scenario where doing it in, you know, in a model-driven form will be different. What you can do is you can embed a custom page right inside of here. So in our case, we want people to enter the vitals for our pets. So all they have to do is click in here where it says enter vitals. And this will know the context of the current record that you're standing on. And now you can have, you know, a beautiful Canvas app, you know, do the rest of the work. This is an example of a custom page that's embedded within a model-driven app um, that will allow you to do that stuff. So it's not the prettiest one, right? It's just, I do this to show you. So for example, if I enter something in here like 20, you'll notice that this picture shows up. If the, it's an overweight puppy, you'll notice that, you know, this changes to a, uh, to a bigger dog. And you can submit the records and they update the, the data on your Dataverse uh, table. And so Juan, if you're gonna do that, would that be like if I wanted to incorporate some of the other controls, like a barcode scanner or a, or a camera control or something like that? Is that how you would bridge the two? Uh, 
you could do it that way or we, where you have some complex logic, right? Let's say you want to be able to filter, you know, a drop down based on some information, right? If you wanted to do it with a regular model driven app, you will need to leverage JavaScript in order to do that, right? Versus you already have your power FX skills, right? You could embed custom form and use all your power FX skills, right? Anything that you know how to do and use it as you would do in a regular Canvas app in order to handle that complex logic. Um, and so someone asked, if a project comes, uh, how can we identify that this project can be done in Canvas or model driven? You know, there's no like perfect formula would be my answer there, right? It's going to be more about figuring out, you know, which one of these fits your need. And, and you know, if you really had both in front of you, you might ask yourself, all right, well, where, where's the data lives? First question, if it lives in Dataverse, okay, both are an option. Because remember, if the data is in SharePoint, you can't build a model driven app on top of SharePoint. But if the data is in Dataverse, you absolutely can. And then it would be about what are my requirements? What are my design requirements? What are the added functionality? And I would almost, I don't know if this is exactly right, but I would almost say I would start with saying, okay, I'm going to do a model driven app until I'm proven otherwise. Like I have a requirement that I can't do on a model driven app. But as long as I'm feel good, like, you know, the app's going to do what model driven does. That's the way I would think about it. I don't know, Juan, how, how would you approach the question? Well, the first thing is you said it, right? You gotta be using Dataverse, right? Because model-driven apps are only native to Dataverse. So if you have that box checked off, then it's most likely I would start with a model-driven app first because it gives you a lot of advantages such as being responsive. So if your requirement is that you want people to be able to use your app on your desktop and your mobile phone, right? And that's a super requirement, right? then model-driven apps, right, they automatically resize to a phone, to a tablet layout, horizontally or vertically, very easily. If you're going, so I will start with, like Shen said, I will start with a model-driven app because I could put a proof of concept very, very rapidly, right? Once I have my data model, I have my tables, my relationships, forms and views, and be able to start using an app real quick. If you get into trouble later where users want more specific forms, then you have your third best friend with a custom. So today, if you're leveraging Dataverse, you should probably start with a model driven app, then a custom page. And if none of those two really work, then down uh, the Canvas application. Yeah, now one thing I do worry about though, so one of the things I teach in Power Platform University when we do the UI UX, um, I guess class, is we talk about you know consistency, right? And one of the key things I try to drive with people is if all your power apps, and I'm, at the time I saw about Canvas apps, if all your Canvas apps look exactly the same, use the same headers, same footer, same button sizes, like it aids adoption, right? Because users don't feel like on a, you know, like they're on an adventure every time they open an app. If, if, but if you're in an environment where every app looks different, then your users don't get that consistency feeling. It makes them less unsure, makes more training, less adoption, et cetera. So that is one of the things that I would have to think a little bit more about, like if I was chewing that step, is a third of my apps are model, a third of my apps are model plus canvas, and a third of my apps are canvas. Now my users have kind of got three different experiences across, you know, my apps and my organization. And I guess it, I could make an argument that that would cause some confusion. I don't, I don't know. I, I, this is like, I'm, I'm literally having this thought for the, right, the first time right this moment. Any, anything there? No, I mean, I, I think it makes sense what you're saying about having a consistent, right? Uh, especially with, I find that model-driven apps, there's so much stuff going around, right? Like if you look at the command bar, right? There's so much going on. So if you have those users that are very specific with the way, you know, they only want to see two buttons, you know, save and close, right? You might be better off with a canvas at that point, right? Because with a model-driven app, right? The, the UI is very specific and it resembles dynamics, right? you know? So it has a lot of nice functionality out of the box, but it might clutter the screen for some of you other users that are very specific UIs. That's something to consider when you yeah. know whenever you want to make the choice between Canvas and model-driven app is who is going to be my end user? Are they very uh, sophisticated, sophisticated end users, right? So they might take advantage of having a model-driven app because you can have native export to Excel functionality, which if you wanted to do that in a Canvas app, all you guys know you got to use the flow combination of for into CSV and you know write all our logic. With a model-driven app, you basically get that off the, you know, off the box, right? By leveraging a basic view, um, so you get 
So you get all that functionality. So speaking of functionality, Diego says, hey, does Dataverse have the ability to connect to external data? I guess the answer is yes, right? But I don't really think of it as Dataverse connecting to external data, though I guess we could talk about virtual tables in a second. But what I would say, Diego, is, you know, like if we think about a model-driven app, it has to be connected and built on top of Dataverse and Dataverse only. So if you had an external data sources that you want in a model-driven app, you would have to bring that into Dataverse somehow, right? And so data flows is probably the most correct answer, right? So data flows uses Power Query. You can set scheduled jobs and things like that to ingest the data stored in Dataverse and then build your model-driven app on. Or, you know, you can get into things like Power Automate Flow. Um, and so you can use Flow to, or yeah, no, that's right, Cloud Flows to, you know, interact. But Dataverse does, or sorry, model-driven apps doesn't talk to Flow the same way that a Canvas app does. Um, you know, we're gonna, so we're gonna have to get that data ingested. You could also get into custom connectors. So, you know, does Dataverse talk to external data? Yes, but you gotta get it in there if you wanna build on it. They also though, I guess, well, they've always had these, but they're, they're starting to make these more prevalent, right? So in Dataverse, there's also this thing called a virtual table. Juan, do you wanna kind of, explain what a virtual table is a little bit there? Definitely, they've been around for a while. They're just making it easier to connect. But basically a virtual table allows you to connect to SharePoint or SQL. And actually the data doesn't physically live within Dataverse. It basically there's a connection between Dataverse and your source data. And you can have your data be updated both ways. So for example, if someone updates a record in SharePoint, and it's connected via virtual table to Dataverse, then automatically it will show in Dataverse and vice versa. If you built an app using that virtual table in Dataverse, it automatically will update in SharePoint. So think about this you know, as a live interface between the two data sources. It does come with a bunch of caveats. So it, it looks and it sounds great on paper, but there are caveats around it. So just limitations on the number of records you know, that can be shown when you use virtual tables. So they're a great addition, but just use with caution. Yeah, virtual tables, like, like you said, they, they've been around, but they are becoming more prevalent. I still, I don't think I've built anything actually on a virtual table. They're still a little, a little be cautious with still, I think is the way to put it. Yes. Captain Trav asked, you know, when I was listing the like ways to like think about apps, like I listed Canvas apps last and we all know like, what does Shane love the most? I love Canvas apps about a thousand times more than I love my own app. So it's really weird to hear me say Canvas app is last in that list. But the reason that, I, that it is, right, is because if it's really just a simple form and maybe a, uh, like a, a filter view of a table or something, like model driven apps can just do that in a minute, right? Like literally one minute if you've got all the data there. Whereas Canvas apps, because we always start with that blank white screen, have to build from it it's going to take more than a minute, even in the most simple scenario. And so, you know, if your requirements meet model driven apps then rock a model driven app, like it's okay, but it, it doesn't take long for me anyway to be like, Oh no, I got to do some canvas apps because I got X, Y, or Z, you know, multiple data sources. Like someone else was just mentioning. There's a lot of reasons not to do model driven apps, but I think because it, it, it knocks out the low hanging fruit so easy, so fast. It's always kind of my, you know, in these scenarios, my first one that I evaluate. And I don't know, but but you're right. It, it feels awkward for me to say that because I love Canvas. I don't know. Want any add there? Or? I, you know, I, I agree with you, you know, low hanging fruit, right? Uh, advantages of, you know, model driven up the bat, right? You don't. I, I, you know, there, this is a, such a big topic, right? People want to talk about delegation, delegation, right? Is there delegation in a model-driven app build, right? And the answer is no, right? So if you're building an app that's going to have hundreds of thousands of records, right? And you want people to be able to search through those records, a model-driven build just magically has, a, you know, will not have any delegation issues, right? You'll be able to sort through all those records. So there's so much more to gain from a model-driven to begin with that that should be your starting point if you're using dataverse right that i think you know we always need to go back into the context right if you have the licensing and you're using dataverse that's when it makes sense to really explore the model driven option right now this is one i don't know the answer to so i'm gonna th let's see if i can do this show thing here but so someone said how about for external users uh we're good to pay for the client licenses would it be better to use uh 
Canvas. Uh, can model driven do external sharing? I yes. it can do. Okay. I, I haven't been down that road. Exactly the same you would do with a canvas, right? You just add them as a guest as, and your tenant. It doesn't matter which side is paying for the licensing, but they need to have a premium license and you're good to go. Very cool. I did not even know that. So there you go. I learned something. Um, this next question, right? I think this is one of the mo the biggest reasons to go to Dataverse. How is security in Dataverse? Dataverse security is top notch, right? Like it's it's more complex. It's more difficult to configure. I'm not going to lie to you there. But, you know, Dataverse security, you know, we can get into row level security. We can get into field level security. Dataverse um, also can do hierarchical, whatever that stupid word is, security, where like you can say, hey, this stuff can only be viewed by people in the same business unit, or this stuff can only be viewed by the manager and two people above the manager. Like you, there's a lot of different security models with Dataverse. It is really crazy how good and how interesting it is when it comes to security models. But because they still haven't updated the UI on all the security model stuff, for like someone just kind of poking around, the security feels terrible. Like you're like, just go make green dots across the board and everyone will have access and it'll be great. But the more you learn about it, the more that you dig in, the more you accept those really nasty looking screens, there's a lot of really cool security stuff that you can do inside of Dataverse. So then this person, how about, um, have you tried converting data from uh, SharePoint to Dataverse? Like, like we talked about this in university yesterday, actually a little bit, but do you have any thoughts on someone who's like, all right, I want to get off SharePoint, get to Dataverse. I want to migrate an existing app. You want to talk through that for a second? Yes. I mean, we, we go over that during class, right? So the first thing you have to do is the data model that you have built in SharePoint might not necessarily be the best data model to use in Dataverse, right? Because Dataverse is a true relational database. So, First thing that you do when you bring over to Dataverse is you really think about your data model. Think about how your relationships should really work in a true relational database. Once you have that defined, then it's just a matter of building a data flow, right? To bring over your data from SharePoint into Dataverse. But since most likely your data model has changed, then you probably, if you have an existing app, at that point, you're probably looking at a rework or a lot of work in order to really move it over from SharePoint into Dataverse. So when people come to me with a scenario, I think about this as a, you know, redoing your app again, because let's face it, right? SharePoint and Dataverse are, are two completely different systems. Yeah, I, I definitely converting an app is uh, is very challenging and everyone's a little bit different, right? It's, uh, it's always very interesting with that. So we've got a couple of questions on pricing, licensing, you know, people not wanting to do it. So, you know, one of the things I would say is that, yeah, right, one of the number one reasons that we don't see people building more model-driven apps, and if I think of our customer base, it's probably less than 5% use model-driven apps, if we're being honest. Um, and one of the biggest reasons for that is because in order to build a model-driven app, it has to be on top of Dataverse, and because it has to be on top of Dataverse and model-driven apps are premium, it requires all the users of the apps to be premium users, right? So all that crazy licensing cost. And so, you know, I definitely get when like, people are like, you know, well, the licensing is just too much. Like, one of the things that I think that people run into when they're like immediately dismiss the licensing is a lot of times we're thinking too small, right? And it's real easy for me to say, right? I'm spending your money, I know. But in a lot of corporations, you know, we think about this one little solution, like, well, I can't afford to buy Power Apps licenses for all these people to do this one app. And that's probably true, right? There's probably not an ROI there. But if you, can get people to think about the bigger picture. Hey, we want to roll out 10 apps or 100 apps or, you know, like get rid of all this third-party software and get everyone, you know, using these apps. Then all of a sudden, you know, the, the cost of going to premium is a lot easier to, to realize, right? That, that's the biggest struggle we see is that people think about going to premium on the scale of just one little app and the math doesn't add up a lot of times. But as if you can think about the ecosystem that you're creating, you want to create, and then all of a sudden you realize, well, if we can get out of SharePoint as a data source and into Dataverse, we get away from those delegation problems. Our performance goes up. You know, we get all of these added benefits. There's a really solid story there, but it's not about one premium app. It's about an ecosystem of premium apps. Right? The customers that we talk to that have premium licensing almost always have 
literally hundreds of power apps, you know, by the time we've talked to them. So that's one of the challenges. And, and one of the things I was trying to expose in the series, right, because I built both the Canvas and the model-driven app on top of Dataverse, was just trying to get you guys familiar with kind of what's going on, what are the additional things. You know, other things that you'll see with like premium licensing. Um, so have you guys heard about managed environments? Microsoft released managed environments earlier this year. Um, I think it was this year. And so like managed environments have all these extra functionalities, all these different things around controls and able to do screen pop-ups and things like that. All that is premium. So, you know, it, it, there's a bunch that you get, but you have to think about premium licensing as an org-wide decision, not a just in the scope of one app. Juan, any two cents on? No, I, I think you hit it right on the nail, right? I, I see a whole bunch of other questions before asking like crazy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's hundreds, thousands of those. Go ahead, jump. If there's one you want to answer, jump in there. Yeah, I think one guy was asking if there is a way to remove show show the charts from a model driven app. Is uh, yes, there is. You have to remove the chart um, role from their security. So if if you give them a role. You know, if, they, if they, you have a role that they're given, you know, in order to use that model-driven app, there's something on their code records called charts. If you remove their access to read charts, then they will be able to see that button to where it was. I, I think I saw a question like three times. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's definitely like with model-driven, we get a whole bunch of stuff, right? Like there's all those buttons at the top, all those export to Excel, interact with Word, the power, right? But you can make a lot of those go away, right? It's, it's just by turning off security. Is that at the... Yep. Yep. You want to share yep. your screen and kind of show some of those buttons you would turn off here. There's, there's your screen. So if you want to just kind of show them maybe some of the things that you would. Yep. So, so for example, right, if you want, if you want, if you don't want people to be able to import the data using the Excel, you know, so this piece right here, right. So just to show you one, if you don't want people to be able to import from Excel and you, you know, you want to remove that, just all you got to do is remove their access to the SBI user role. So if you go over to any user role, if you go to core records, there's somewhere in here it says import, import. So if, if you don't have, if you give, you don't have a role that has, allows them to do that, they will go away. Same thing with the chart. Somewhere in here, there's something that, you know, that allows them to use charts. So if you remove that role, they won't be able to do that. So a role basically gives you two things, right? It controls what they can do in the environment and also what kind of access they have to individual entities. All right, and these are the fun things that Juan gets into in his live model-driven class. Um, so, Here's another one for you, Juan. I'll throw it up on the screen. So we used to do this with those business process flows. Like, is this still a thing? Or if you want to read jo Josh's question for me there and then just kind of... Yes. What if you want to do... You know... Yep. I mean, natively, you could do that via business process flow. But here's another case for a custom page, right? If you want people to really follow a specific path, right? You can use the model. And I do this a lot in real life. I really leverage model-driven views because I think they're powerful, right? But if I want to have a very specific user input, I may use a custom form in order to navigate them to the very specific, um, you know, UI in order for them to enter data. So you could do it either way, a custom page or a business process flow, Josh. So another one here, uh, can Microsoft access connect to Power Apps? So yes, but I don't think that's what you're asking. So can I use Microsoft Access Database as a data source? No, that is that you cannot do. But can I go into Microsoft? So if you go to Microsoft Access, one of the things that you can do inside there, I think they might call them virtual table or linked tables, I think is what they call them, right? They call them linked tables inside Access. In Access, you can take a table and make it a linked table, which then means that that table inside the Access database isn't in the access data anymore, base anymore. It is linked to an external source. And so SharePoint can be one of the ways you do linked tables, but Dataverse is also now a way you can do linked tables. So what you can actually do is you can go into your access database and there's a whole wizard built in now where you can basically go in the access database, right click on the table and say, send this to Dataverse and it'll go create the Dataverse table for you, move the data, and then create that link table connection. So now you still use access. Access is still your front end, but the data instead of living in the access database would live in the magical Dataverse cloud or the Share or SharePoint. Right? Those are two that I've done it with. Yeah, it's one of those things. I keep trying to make a YouTube video around access and Power Apps. And I just can't. 
can't wrap my head around what I want to do there, but but it's I think it's definitely a very common question. How do you do? All right, here you go. Juan, here's another one for you. How do you deal with responsiveness in Canvas apps? You always build responsive apps with containers. <laughs> Juan was a big uh, fan of his first responsive project. I remember it very well. <laughs> I, I I'll answer this with another one. Just to keep in mind, if you're gonna be using custom pages within model driven, you need to make those responsive. So if I'm building a custom page in a model-driven app, then at that point, yes, I'm using the containers and I'm messing with the height, you know, width, uh, all that mumbo jumbo that you need to make uh, responsiveness in Canvas apps. Outside of that, it really depends, right, Shane? I mean, so it's just add so much, so much work, right, that the the value might not be there. Totally agree, right? I think that. Um... There's a lot of cases where we try to talk customers out of building a Canvas app as responsive because it's it's often less work to build a mobile and a tablet version of an app than it is to make one app that can do both. My one piece Especially if you have a lot of controls, right? Yeah. Because the apps that we built are very complex, right? We have apps that have already by itself, you know, thousands of controls. And if you start piling into those thousands of controls, containers over containers over containers, it just becomes an unmanageable thing, right? If you're building a simple app, right, that's just going to be one or two screens, then at that point, you know, maybe making it responsive should make sense. The other thing I would tell you, if you are going to build responsive, right, because we all end up having to do it at some point, if you can control the form factors, you've got a better chance of success, right? So like, if you can say, all right, this is going to work on a desktop PC and an iPhone 12 Pro, right? Like if you can nail that down and they're you know, the iPhone's only going to work horizontally and the, you know, the more specific you can be, the better chance you have of success. Whereas if they're like, no, I need this app to be responsive on any device, any orientation, any size, like the amount of work that that takes is, is, is a hundred to one of building a simple app because now all of a sudden you're having to account for every little break point. Well, what if they hold it this way? What if they hold it this way? Oh, now they want a button. Well, now what does that button have to do this way, this way, this way, this way. So the less scenarios that you can account for in responsive, if you can drill your customer down, like, or your, your internal stakeholder to just supporting a couple of responsive scenarios, very specifically, your odds of success go way up. Uh, somebody asked if we do this all the time, you know, so like I know guy on cube, like those guys do this almost every Saturday. Um, we do not do this on a regular basis yet. We're, we're still trying to figure it out. I would like to do more of these live sessions um, on YouTube. We do as part of uh, our training over training.powerapps911.com. Every month we have office hours. Um, so we host those both a morning and an afternoon session to kind of hit all the world time zones. And so there, all of our current training subscribers join one of these. So we do one of these live for just our training students every month. And we do that via Teams, not via YouTube. If you really want to do these type of things every month, you can just sign up for the $20 a month subscription. You get invited to office hours. You can ask a question every month. $20, it's pretty cheap. Or if you sign up for one or I's live training classes that are upcoming, then hey, those also will uh, do that. What would you suggest is best for CRM solution model canvas, right? To answer that one is model driven apps are actually a derivative of dynamic CRM. So if you want to build a CRM, I will go with a model driven app because you know, you have your contact out of the box table, you have your account out of the box table, they already have a pre-built CR CRM for you. So if your goal is to build a lightweight CRM, then you probably should go with a model-driven app because that's initially what a model-driven app used to be. It used to be a CRM system. You know what I'm really sad about is none of these questions have given me an excuse to talk about ChatGPT. This is the longest I've went in a day without saying ChatGPT, so now <laughs> I've said it. I'm really buying into this whole AI story. Have you have you played with it much? I, I, I use it on a daily basis. Uh, honestly, I, you know, I, I'm not a strong SQL developer, right? But now I've gotten so much better because now I can say, you know, give me this SQL code, right? And I can, you know, move on from there when I, whenever I work with SQL databases. Yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you, right? And uh, doing it with AI, uh, Daniel's in the chat in the YouTube world, right? And I, he's got a whole channel dedicated to that. And he's been doing really cool stuff with Copilot, which is super interesting. A little above my pay grade, but very interesting. Oh, another very common thread in the uh, the chat has been questions around power pages or power portals as they used to be called. So I have zero content on that. Um, Juan doesn't cover those either. We do have a couple of developers here at Power Apps 901 that do projects on that stuff. Long story short, you know, they are low code-ish 
Um, but the idea is that you can build those public facing websites, so whether it's anonymous or authenticated or only internal, we can build websites on top of Dataverse and the Power Platform. It does have a separate licensing story that goes with it. Um, and it's all premium. There's no included or free standard licenses with Power Pages. So there's a lot of questions over there. But yeah, when you see Portal and Pages, they're the same thing. They have the same licensing. It's the same product. They just renamed it along the way and made it a lot better. But all that kind of stuff goes the same. The only thing I will add to that, Shane, is whenever people want to start thinking about public facing apps, right? We get a lot of those things, right? You have to start thinking about a power page or portal, right? That that is, you know, if, if that that is your end goal, right? You want to build an application that you want anonymous people or people outside of your organization, in, in between quotes, right? In order to be able to access those applications, then you got to start thinking about those power pages and portals at that point. Um. So someone in chat asked, is there a way to check if an internet connection, if you have an internet connection in Canvas app? Um, and it says connections not connected only checks if you're connected to a network, not the internet. Marcus, that's the only way that connected connections not connected is the only way that I would have known how to do it. So I don't know if there's a way for you to completely validate whether or not it's talking the internet. Maybe you could call a flow. I don't know if a flow would a flow would not be able to be triggered if you weren't connected to the internet. So that would be a way for you to do it. Just have a little simple flow that just has a trigger of power apps and it immediately responds to power apps with them alive. You could trigger that flow, and if that flow failed, that would be one way. Um, another question here, where to go? Um, what's your opinion on creating business applications and licensing supporting them for small businesses for a monthly fee? Well, uh, Mustafa, I call that Power Apps 911. We've done that for thousands of customers at this point. We've literally built thousands of customer apps at this point. And yeah, I think it's a great business model. I think there's a lot of demand and you're right. And one of the interesting things I think with the power platform, whether it's being a consultant or doing it internally is the ROI on power apps is so through the roof. It is so high. That it's, it's one of those things that should do well, regardless of the mood of the economy, right? Like one of our customers, we replaced something they were spending a hundred thousand dollars a year on with one power app that I don't know how much they spent, but tens of thousands of dollars They had a one-time cost of tens of thousands of dollars to build this thing. And they got rid of a hundred thousand dollar a year subscription service. Like it was a no brainer for them to put this in. So yeah, I think it's a great, uh, great field to be in. Uh, so my ask Juan, do you have a separate YouTube channel? I don't, I have my own little blog, right? YouTube channel is a lot of work in top of having to keep up with everything that Microsoft throws at you daily. So maybe in the future I'll, I'll put out my own content in YouTube, but no. Yeah, well, when I put the recording of this out, I'll make sure I put down in the description, I'll put Juan's LinkedIn so you guys can follow him over there. But he does throw stuff up from time to time out on LinkedIn. And yeah, you know, I also, one of my goals is to do more model-driven content this year, which means having Juan on the channel more more regularly. But so far, I'm kind of terrible at a lot of my goals. So I, I think someone asked about licensing is confusing. Let, let, let me answer that, answer that question, right? You, you don't need a premium license in order to create a model-driven app or a Canvas app on top of Dataverse. Licensing really kicks in when you want to share the app with other users. And at that point, right, everyone is a license, right? But anyone can go in there in the default environment and build the model driven. And I see a lot of people get tripped up by that, right? And then, you know, they try to share it and that's where licensing kicks in. So do not be confused because you, yes, you're able to build your apps able to create tables in Dataverse, right? But, you know, bear in mind that you will need a license when you want to share that with other users. Yeah. So there's a follow on uh, licensing question. I just tripped over. So someone said, Hey, they were going to try pay as you go. So I do have a YouTube video for that. I don't have it in front of me, but I will add that below if I remember as well. But so my pay as you go video talks about how to set all that up. And so your question was like, what does that cost? Well, it costs you nothing to set it up, like literally zero. And then you only would pay if you're paying retail, which I'm guessing since you're a very small shop, you're only you're going to pay retail. You're going to pay $10 per user per app per month, but only when they use it. So if you share it with a thousand people and only four people use it that month, then you'd only pay for four people that month. That's the beauty of pay as you go. If you want to share it with a thousand people and all thousand people are going to use it every month, then you should just buy a per app license. It's at half the cost. Um, but yeah, so I have a whole video that'll walk you through that M and J and K. That's really hard to say. Um, if you wanted to see what that would, uh, um, somebody else, you know, because I said chat GPT, I got, I got what I want. I got some chat GPT questions over here. Yay. So, you know, yeah, we are absolutely, as Juan said, we are using it every day over here. Um, you know, there's a whole, I did a video on that that blew up. Yay. Video that blew up. 
Um, but you know, we're using it for things like code comments, explaining code. But then we also, the last demo I kind of show in there is I use it to manipulate code. Like a lot of people on the team have a hard time with um, HTML. So I fed it a block of HTML and said, hey, add you know inline styles to this, add a header row, add shadows to the header row. And ChatGPT just did it. I copy and paste their code in and poof, I got what I wanted. So yeah, we're absolutely using it all the time over here. You know, Daniel does a great job of talking about this, you know, and reminding people that like, it doesn't always do the whole job for us, but it gets you unstuck, right? Like Juan said, write me some SQL. It probably wrote him SQL that was, somewhere between 90 to 100% of the way there. So he might be like, oh, you know, I got to make this little tweak. But but compared to starting with a blank cursor, looking at Juan saying write SQL or having code that was 99% what he wanted, I think Juan wants that 99% code every time, right? Like it just, it, it gives you something very specific to fix instead of just being like, all right, Juan, write a store procedure, go. I, I think on the pay as you go, yes, you do need an Azure subscription. That is, that is a requirement. They, they're going to bill your credit card for whatever usage is happening every month on the Azure account. But having an Azure subscription doesn't cost you something in itself. Like if you don't use it, it would literally just be zero. So my ask yeah. if I was gonna make more Dataverse videos, I need to make more Dataverse videos. It, it is on my list. <laughs> but by the way, we, we do cover a lot of Dataverse in the model driven class, right? Like 50% of it, it's Dataverse concepts, security, Right, you know, creating tables, choice fields. We we really get into the details of every data type in there. Those type of things you can also take for Canvas apps as well, because they do translate. Right, security in Dataverse applies to both model driven and Canvas apps. Data types apply to both uh, uh, applications. So totally agree with that. Right, and that's why I think I'm going to rename the class and start calling it um, Dataverse and model driven apps because you have so much Dataverse in there. You also get what we internally call the Dataverse Bible. Right, so Juan is written this giant tens of what, like 40 pages or something at this point? 60 pages. 60 pages. So as part of the class, you get a 60 page document that explains all these Dataverse concepts. It was one of those ideas I gave Juan and he like took it like 60 times further than I expected him to, but uh, it's very cool stuff. So here, I'm gonna share my screen again real quick. And so just to give you guys an idea, right? So over here on the live training, so Juan's class is coming up in April. Um, and so April 3rd through the 7th, this is his Dataverse and Model Driven class, a five-day live class with Juan to learn all the things about Dataverse and Model Driven. And in March, I guess I should have done this in the opposite order, I have a class, um, Power Apps and Power Automate. So this is Canvas Apps and Cloud Flows. And so that will be live for five days with me. And if you want to sign up for both of them, just shoot me an email, Shane at PowerApps911.com, and I will get you a giant discount because we're running, we're trying to run this promo to see if people are more interested in, um, you know, signing up and doing these these types of classes when they are, and people are more interested in signing up for this, you know, and learning these as a package. So, so we have that. I think on that note, Juan, it's probably time for us to say goodbye. So, thank you to all the Power Apps 911 chatters and all of you for joining the chat. Right, like there's been literally thousands of questions that have went over there. Um, and so lots of questions got asked, lots of questions got answered. So thank you for everyone that helped over there. Juan, thank you for joining me and being the, uh, the voice of reason when it comes to model driven apps. And I guess with that, I'm going to say thanks and have a great day. Hey, me again, before you go, click on the subscribe button, right? Join the list of hundred thousand plus people that subscribed already. Or if you need any help, right? Check us out at Power Apps 911. We do big projects, little projects. We do training. We do everything and we can help you. Or if you want to see more videos, you probably do, then just click on the playlist above. Cool. Thanks and have a great day.